A lecture is an entirely appropriate way to celebrate Ruskin, for it became his most powerful medium. Those Childhood Sundays spent listening to sermons in the Beresford Chapel in South London, and those Sunday afternoons spent writing them up, seem to have paid off. Lectures were such a direct way of engaging with his audience. Ruskin's personality is present in every line that he wrote. Reading him is unlike reading any of his contemporaries, except possibly Carlyle, though I must say I prefer Ruskin's sunshine and skies to Carlyle's thunder and lightning. Ruskin created an intimate, personal connection with the reader. How much more powerful an experience must it have been to be in the same room with him. Eyewitness accounts suggest that the printed texts of his lectures are but echoes of what it was like to hear and see Ruskin in person and to experience the surprise and delight of the visual aids that he deployed. One of the striking features of Ruskin's lectures is their titles and the titles he gave them in collected form. The Two Paths, Sesame and Lilies, Aratra Pentelici, Ariadne Florentina, and so on. On the face of it, the title of this evening's lecture is considerably less elusive. Simply, Ruskin today. But it is not without Ruskinian resonances. Ruskin adopted today as his personal motto on his seal, hyphenated with a capital T and a capital D. A version of this, enclosing the Ruskin coat of arms, appears on the title page of every volume of the London, of the library edition of his complete works. Today, he said, was tacitly underlined to myself with the warning, the night cometh when no man may work. The allusion is to St. John chapter 9, verse 4, quoting Jesus' words, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The urgency of Ruskin's message is driven by that fundamental opposition between day, light and life, and night, darkness and death. Ruskin today, with the hyphen, is also the name of the entirely informal organization that was convened by my friend and colleague David Barry in the run-up to the celebration of Ruskin's centenary in 2000. These collaborative meetings of the many very different institutions involved with aspects of Ruskin proved so useful that they continued on after 2000 until it was, oh, it's time to celebrate the bicentenary of Ruskin's birth in 2019. It's a truly Ruskinian conception. It has no formal organization, no qualification for membership apart from interest, no constitution, and not even a bank account. Thanks to private generosity, it does have a website and a badge. But if it does have an overarching purpose, it is to demonstrate that nobody owns Ruskin. Everyone has their own Ruskin. It's a, an example of what that great biographer of Ruskin, Tim Hilton, described to me in a recent letter as Ruskinian kindness and purpose. We must thank 
all those individuals and organizations who have worked together to demonstrate, in Ruskin's words, government and cooperation are in all things the laws of life, anarchy and competition, the laws of death. The title of this lecture has no hyphen. Yet, though apparently simple, it is not without ambiguity. This year, have we been celebrating Ruskin for what he was, wrote and did in his lifetime, or for what he means to us today? If the former, then there is indeed much to celebrate. But there are also things that, from today's perspective, are to be deplored, depending, that is, on your views on democracy, imperialism, racism, gender roles, and sexuality. If we are celebrating what we think he means today, then there is a danger that this Ruskin has no real relation to the complex and controversial character that we are supposed to be celebrating. As Professor Sarah Atwood has wisely warned, well-intentioned attempts to make Ruskin relevant too often mean, in practice, making him over in our image, bringing similarities into sharp relief while casting important and valuable differences into shadow. It was not just my because my initial enthusiasm for Ruskin was disciplined by my university teachers, that I believe it is essential to stay at a critical distance, however seductive his personality and moving his story. It's only at a certain distance that we can use, to use the Ruskinian phrase, I'm delighted, among many I've heard quoted this to, during today, that we can see clearly. Ruskin produced the perfect paradox on this matter when he wrote, no true disciple of mine will ever be a Ruskinian. To be true to Ruskin, you must be true to yourself. Neither my politics nor my lack of faith qualify me as a disciple of Ruskin. So the question that an occasion such as I bicentenary inevitably gives rise to, what would Ruskin say today, is for me a non-question. We can't possibly know the man is dead. But his ideas, his values, do they not have something to say across the great divide of time? Counterfactually, what would we be thinking if Ruskin had never existed? Would we value the natural world differently? Would we appreciate certain artists and the need to preserve certain buildings differently? Would we understand the relationship between art and society differently? I think we would. Ruskin not only saved some marks from a ruthless restoration, he changed the world's view of Venice. What has been remarkable about this year, even more so than in the centenary in 2000, is the number of people who want to find out more about Ruskin. Tonight's audience, the people who are here today and tomorrow, that's evidence of this interest. The interest may have been sparked by the vicissitudes of his life story, but then comes the feeling that Ruskin has something to tell us. This became immediately evident in January with the exhibition of The Power of Seeing at Two Temple Place in London. Yet this has been neither a metropolitan nor an exclusively British phenomenon as the exhibitions and conferences that have taken place nationwide and worldwide, and that are yet to happen, demonstrate. This interest appears to be something more 
than the respect paid to comparable 19th century figures. One reason may be that the visual evidence of Ruskin's thinking, the drawings that he made, what he chose to draw, and the way he integrated them into his arguments allow us an immediate and one-to-one -one connection with the person who made these works and that we are fortunate still to have. We can still see what Ruskin saw. Regrettably, the impoverishment of our literary skills can limit our access to his magnificent prose. But once we invest a little effort, then the rich imagery of his language, what I have called the argument of the eye, allows us to experience more profoundly what Ruskin thought and felt. A city of marble, did I say? Nay, rather a golden city paved with emerald. For truly every pinnacle and turret glanced or glowed, overlaid with gold or bossed with jasper. Beneath the unsullied sea drew in deep breathing to and fro its eddies, or I could go on. But what I want to propose to do this evening is not to answer the question, what would Ruskin say today, but try to identify a number of principles that he set out in the 19th century that might still be useful in the 21st. It is a selective list. Ruskin never voted, and there is no more urgent need to vote than today. Ruskin was an authoritarian, a believer in hierarchy. I believe we need democratic participation more than ever. What possibly tempers the apparent harshness of Ruskin's political theory was his inability, in fact, to be able to carry it out in practice. And if Ruskin's writings are said to have inspired the imperialism of Cecil Rhodes, then they also inspired the anti-imperialist Mahatma Gandhi. Such is the holism of Ruskin's thought. My first principle also introduces the second. Ruskin declared, the beauty of nature is the blessedest and most necessary of lessons for men and that all other efforts in education are futile until you have taught your people to love fields, birds, and flowers. As it happens, this was written in the context of what we would now call an environmental protest against the proposal to build a railway in the Lake District. But the term environment which is, of course, not a word in his vocabulary, is problematic as far as Ruskin is concerned. However virtuous may be a care for the environment, it treats the natural world as something external to ourselves. It becomes objectified and thus, whether we like it or not, becomes raw material, ripe for exploitation, emptied of mystery and spirit. The material environment surrounds us, but for Ruskin, nature is something we are part of and inhabits us. And therefore, whatever we do to nature, we do to ourselves. And there is no doubt, as the rainforests of the Amazon burn, that we are doing terrible things to nature and so to ourselves. Climate change, and I notice the coincidence of this lecture with the demonstrations going on today, climate change is a far greater menace than any of our petty political squabbles, distressing as they are. And Ruskin was among the first to draw attention to its dangers. Ruskin's love of nature, its mystery and spirit, 
was integral with his love of God. His training in natural theology, which understood the world as God's creation, meant that he saw no conflict between the appreciation of nature as an artist and the study of nature as a scientist, since they were both part of what he called the science of aspects of things. It is as much a fact to be noted of their constitution that they produce such and such an effect upon the eye or heart as that they are made up of certain atoms or vibrations of matter. The eye or heart, these are the symbiotic organs of Ruskin's world view. In a wonderful phrase, Ruskin wrote a perception in terms of the intellectual lens and moral retina. He used it first in the second volume of Modern Painters in 1846, when he was describing what he called the theoretic faculty, a faculty of the mind that was superior to mere aesthetic perception because it involved a psychological, a spiritual, as well as sensory appreciation of the world. Ruskin, as we've heard several times today, relished self-contradiction. But nearing the end of his career in 1877, when he revisited modern painters in a lecture at Oxford, he declared, the intellectual lens a moral retina, the lens faithfully and far collecting, the retina faithfully and inwardly receiving. I cannot better the expression. So, no self-contradiction there. The eye and heart were equal instruments in the science of aspects, and the natural world was its subject. At its simplest, nature was life, and with light, constituted the highest embodiment of value. But then, in 1871, came Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, with its disturbing subtitle and selection in relation to sex. This cancelled all meaning to life by reducing it to a perpetual struggle for the domination of resources and shriveled the beauty of plants and animals to no more than a utilitarian device to ensure sexual, successful sexual reproduction. The light in Ruskin's life began to go out. And if we do not adopt a different attitude to nature, so will ours. As we know, Ruskin protested against the struggle for the domination of resources by the unregulated capitalism of his day. <laughs> There's a marvellous metaphor in his first overtly economic tract unto this last, when he describes a shipwreck off the Californian coast during the gold rush. One of the passengers went overboard with 200 pounds of gold belted round his waist <laughs> and duly drowned. Now, asked Ruskin, as he was sinking, had he the gold or the gold him? The point that we are possessed by our possessions underlines the way that Ruskin was concerned with the morality of consumption as much as production. The fruits of the earth have no value if they are not appreciated by those that consume them. This is value in use, not value in exchange. Value in use is a matter of qualitative, not quantitative judgment. And the use that something is put to will not just govern its value to the users, but the value of the users themselves. Fortunately, we have a living example of the right relationship between man and nature that Ruskin wanted to establish. 
the agricultural practices of the Guild of St George on the 120 acres of farmland, orchards and woods at Bewdley in the Wire Forest, which the Guild has owned since Ruskin's time. The aim is to be both economically and ecologically sustainable. And Ruskin Land, as it is called, is part of a wider partnership, the Wire Community Land Trust, which helps landowners to restore and improve their properties and contributes to the Wire Forest Landscape Partnership, covering most of the 6,000 acres of forest. Now, these practices are not a return to the past. The very modern sawmill makes a vital contribution to the local economy. But they provide a practical example of Ruskin's intention in founding the Guild of St George to shape some small piece of English ground, beautiful, peaceful and fruitful. Beautiful, peaceful, fruitful and an educational resource. For Ruskin Land is also a place for learning, not just about man's relation to nature, but about the self-realization that Ruskin believed could be achieved by craft and indeed by unalienated labor, as we tend a garden, mend a fence, cook food. This helps to restore our relationship with nature the nature that we, of which we are a part. As to education, then the survival of the Ruskin School of Drawing at Oxford into the 21st century, formerly endowed by Ruskin in 1875, and now just called the Ruskin School of Art, this suggests another Ruskinian principle that has applicability today. By this, I do not simply mean the importance of visual education in itself. Accuracy of observation empowers the non-linear visual imagination to make links and associations that the blunt bricks of verbal logic inhibit. It's important to understand that actually Ruskin did not found his drawing school to make artists. And that was not his intention when he gave drawing classes at the London Working Men's College in the 1850s. He wanted to develop the powers of the visual imagination dependent on the coordination of hand and eye, eye and heart, that would make it possible for a carpenter, or for that matter, a captain of industry, to be happier as a carpenter or a captain. Ruskin founded his drawing school in explicit opposition to the government's schools of design, as we have heard. A Gradgrindian system of centralized administration that demanded examinable conformity and that was dependent on payment by measured results. Its purpose was to defend British manufacturers from foreign competition, to define knowledge by asserting what it was and what it was not, and to meet the assumed expectations of the labour market. Sounds familiar? The utilitarian principles that were being imposed on visual education in Ruskin's day are now being imposed on public education as a whole. The enforcement in the state sector of the EBAC, the English Baccalaureate, is doing to the entire field of British education what Ruskin's principles opposed in the field of art. And it is in the field of art that the most damage is being done by a system that requires the almost exclusive study of so-called STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and maths, it's there that the damage is most evident. Since its introduction in 2010, the EBAC has progressively squeezed the imaginative life out of British education. Now, Ruskin was formally and informally a teacher. He was as interested in the teaching of children, 
notably the female pupils of Margaret Bell's progressive school at Winnington in Cheshire, as he was in trying to redirect the values and interests of the elite at Oxford. And again, he made an important contribution there by supporting women's education through his gifts to Somerville and also to Girton and Newnham in Cambridge. The contribution and continuation of the, uh, to this day of the May Queen Festival that he devised for the then all-female Whitelands Teacher Training College is a delightful expression of his educational values. But for all that Ruskin was, was concerned with right seeing and right reading, this was not for instrumental purposes. He was not that interested in the three R's. Singing and dancing were just as important in his curriculum. He once even provocatively suggested that reading and writing might be dispensed with entirely if unsuitable to the development of the child. Instead, he chose the alternative, Wordsworth's less utilitarian and much more affecting triad, admiration, hope, and love, terms which I suspect have yet to appear in an Ofsted report. <laughs> Without a commitment to a holistic education that includes the arts, it is very difficult to see how in the future we will have very much art, both in terms of practitioners and equally important in having what Ruskin saw as his duty to encourage an informed audience. And for me, this is the most important Ruskinian principle of all, as he promulgated it in his inaugural lecture as Slade Professor of Fine Art at Oxford in 1870. This is what I have chiefly to say to you. The art of any country is the exponent of its social and political virtues. By art, of course, he meant culture in general. And I have to say that it was this principle that gave me my vocation as a cultural historian and as a theatre critic. Almost everything I have written has been an audit, in Ruskin's terms, of what I have been privileged to enjoy across the arts. If we conduct an audit of this country's social and political virtues as reflected in its current attitude to the arts and culture, then we must have to conclude that we are not in the best of health. Regardless of what kind of art is on offer, there are widespread social and economic differences in engagement with culture and geographic differences in what is available. As I've already suggested, young people are being discouraged from engagement with the arts at school. Outside school, opportunities to experience the arts are unequally distributed. In the view of in view of the very real cultural diversity in this country, the creative industries and much of public culture remains overwhelmingly class-bound and racially discriminatory. Arts Council England, which has recently conducted its own audit, appears to agree, adding, I quote, many creative practitioners and leaders of culture organisations report a retreat from innovation, risk-taking, and sustained talent development. If we properly analyse the figures in another official audit, the government's Taking Part survey, then as few as 10% of the adult population are truly engaged with the arts. Those who are, and the organisations that service them, including the Arts Council, must bear some responsibility for this. I hardly need remind you that at present we are a bitterly divided country, fighting a cultural civil war. 
What was remarkable about the results of the 2016 referendum was the way that the concentration of Remain and Leave votes mapped onto those parts of the country where arts provision was highest or lowest. Successive administrations have underfunded the arts, museums and heritage, smoothing over the cracks with money from the National Lottery. Ruskin would have deplored such a tax on the poor for the benefit of the rich, masquerading as a game of chance. The financial situation of local authorities who maintain the broader civic in infrastructure upon which Arts Council funded organisations depend is dire. Ruskin believed that the maintenance of culture was a national responsibility. Capitalism had created nothing but a national debt. His purpose was to create a national store. He wrote, The possession of such a store by the nation, note, by the nation, would signify that there were no taxes to pay, that everybody had clothes enough and some stuff laid by for next year that everybody had food enough and plenty of salted pork, pickled walnuts, potted shrimps and other concerns in the cupboard. That everybody had jewels enough and some of the biggest laid by in treasuries and museums and of persons caring for such things that everybody had as many books and pictures that they could read or look at with quantities of the highest quality besides in easily accessible public libraries and galleries. This utterly delightful personal evocation of public provision from pickled walnuts to public libraries enfolds the idea of a welfare state, which this self-described violent Tory of the old school would have been astonished to see brought into being by a subsequent generation of Ruskinians of a quite different political persuasion. But this is what Ruskin meant by wealth, as in his most celebrated and profoundest principle, there is no wealth but life. Being a dialectical thinker, it was part of his genius to create a counter-image to wealth, ilf. It was the ilf of 19th century industrialism that provoked one of his most eloquent passages in the Stones of Venice. The great cry that rises from all our manufacturing cities, louder than their furnace blast, is all in very deed for this, that we manufacture everything there except men. We blanch cotton and strengthen steel and refine sugar and shape pottery, but to brighten, to strengthen, to refine, or to form a single living spirit never enters into our estimate of advantages. In our own day, we could have no better example of what he meant by ilf than the way that the money behind the health represented by the patronage of the arts by the Sackler Trust has turned out to be the byproduct of the ilf of the opioid crisis affecting both Britain and America. That scandal is ending, yet cultural institutions are still being driven into the arms of ilf creators who wish to launder their reputations, the oligarchs, the banks, the oil companies, because this country is so reluctant to take support for the arts seriously, indeed, to take the arts seriously at all. And this brings me to a final point about Ruskin's value today. It's not a principle but an attitude, and it has been little commented on in this bicentenary year, where naturally we have celebrated Ruskin's sympathy and sweetness. But there is another side to his personality. I mean, 
Ruskin's anger. Blanched sun, blighted grass, blinded man. If, in conclusion, you ask me for any conceivable cause or meaning of these things, I can tell you none according to your modern beliefs. But I can tell you what meaning it would have borne to the men of old time. Remember, for the last 20 years, England and all foreign nations have, either tempting or following her, have blasphemed the name of God deliberately and openly, and have done iniquity by proclamation, every man doing as much injustice to his brother as in his power to do. Of states in such moral gloom, every seer of old predicted the physical gloom, saying, the light shall be darkened in the heavens thereof, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. This famous passage from his 1884 lecture, The Storm Cloud of the 19th Century, I find more powerful, I'm afraid, than the chance of Extinction Rebellion. And Ruskin could be equally excoriating in matters of art and education. Tragically, his anger and his frustration at the failure of people to heed his message eventually darkened his own mind and silenced his voice. But if we are to give effect to the Ruskinian principles that I have suggested, then we need his anger. As I've done this evening, Professor Dinah Birch has also emphasised the direct appeal that Ruskin made to his listeners and to those who have subsequently read him. His anger drives that appeal, for it is part of his character. As she has explained, his identity was formed by the twin drivers of Victorian idealism, Romanticism and Evangelicalism, both of which, she writes, professed the authority of the heart, not the intellect. As our own culture shifts towards the primacy of feeling, this impulse feels a great deal more pertinent than was the case when the cool breezes of modernism were sweeping across the Western world. Ruskin's values, she argues, his belief that the instincts of his own soul rather than the precepts of a systematic doctrine should direct a reader's principles now seem allied with the zeitgeist. Well, I do think that helps to explain the apparent success of this year's bicentenary. But is it not possible that Ruskin was always more in touch with the feelings of ordinary men and women than the heartless utilitarians and grasping capitalists of his own day. In 1895, Leo Tolstoy wrote that the still living Ruskin was one of the remarkable men, not only of England and our time, but of all countries and all times. He is one of those rare men who think with their hearts. And so he thought and said not only what he himself had seen and felt, but what everyone will think and say in the future. As we enter a fresh era of Ruskin studies, while we must preserve our Ruskinian kindness and purpose, we shall have to add a new principle. Not the argument of the eye, but the argument of the heart. I pass the baton on, and it bears the words, there is no wealth but life. Thank you.